Welcome back. Now that we have a good understanding of the hierarchical organization of plant bodies, now we're going to take a look at how those bodies are put together, how they grow and develop. And so we're going to come back to the last couple of these questions that we posed at the beginning of the last web lecture. So we thought in the previous lecture a little bit about the evolutionary pressures, the different jobs that different parts of the plants had to do in terms of the diversity in size and shape of plants. And in this case, we're going to be thinking about uh, how variations in developmental pattern uh, contribute to the diversity in plants and also just what are the mechanisms that allow plants to grow throughout their lives. So we're going to be building up over the course of this web lecture toward this summary concept map and we will work our way through all of these different levels of development and come back and summarize all of this at the end of the web lecture. So first of all, the ultimate source of growth in a plant are tissues called meristems. So meristems are going to be responsible for generating new cells. So a plant can grow throughout its life. This is called indeterminate growth. It's not limited at a particular size. It stops growing. As long as conditions are favorable, a plant will continue to grow. And plants can grow continuously due to the activity of these meristems. These are unspecialized tissues composed of dividing cells. These are equivalent to embryonic stem cells, the undifferentiated cells that we see during development in animals. So most animals and also some plant organs cease to grow when they reach a certain size, and this is called determinant growth. There are some fish and other vertebrates that can continue to grow throughout their lives, but most animals are going to reach a particular size and then stop. So let's first think about primary growth in plants. So this is going to be the growth that elongates or extends the plant body. So plants grow throughout their lives because they have many meristems. So these are populations of undifferentiated cells that retain the ability to undergo mitosis. And so if we think about primary growth, these are mostly associated with what we call apical meristems. They're found at the tip of each root and shoot. So in the shoots, both in those apical buds and axial buds are each going to have an apical meristem at the tip. And these are going to be responsible for primary growth, lengthening growth. The cells and tissues derived from apical meristems make up the primary plant body. And apical meristems are going to give rise to three, three distinct primary meristems, which are in turn going to give rise to those three major tissue systems in the plant body. So protoderm is going to give rise to the dermal tissue system. Ground meristem gives rise to the ground tissue system and procambium gives rise to the vascular tissue system. So here we have an image of an apical meristem in a shoot and an apical meristem in a root. And here we can see this apical meristem. The pink is where cells are actively dividing. And here's an apical meristem in an axillary bud next to this leaf that we see coming off. And so the apical meristem in shoots are protected by these leaf primordia that are coming around, these newly developing leaves that are coming around and surrounding this delicate apical meristem tissue. It's actively dividing meristem tissue. We can also see in the very center of both the, the leaf primordium and also coming through the center of the growing root, the procambium, so this is going to give rise to the vascular system, the protoderm on the outside, this very outside layer of cells in both cases, it's going to give rise to the dermal system, and then the stuff in the middle, the ground meristem, which is going to give rise to the ground tissue. So let's look in a more diagrammatic form at the arrangement of these different primary meristem tissues that are going to give rise to the main tissue systems. So here we have the meristem, the dividing cells at the very tip, guarded by these leaf primordia. And then we have an area where cells are being divided. And again, we've got the vascular in the center, ground outside of it, and then dermal precursors on the outside. And these cells are going to divide in such a way that elongates that tip. So it's going to divide lengthwise and elongate. So you can see here, the youngest cells closest to the meristem, the older cells um, being closer to being differentiated. And as we go 
from the source out to the older tissues, these cells are becoming longer, and that's going to result in overall elongating growth in the shoot or root. We have another form of meristems that is going to add thickness to woody plants, and this is a process called secondary growth as opposed to primary growth. So primary growth, growth remember, is going to elongate. Now secondary growth is going to thicken. So there are two lateral meristems the vascular cambium and the cork cambium. The vascular cambium adds layers of vascular tissue called secondary xylem, which is what we think of as the wood, and secondary phloem. The cork cambium replaces the epidermis with a layer called periderm, which is thicker and tougher. This is that outer layer um, that we generally think of as the bark of the tree. Taking a closer look at how the secondary growth occurs to be able to achieve an increase in diameter of the tree. So here we see the vascular cambium in red here, the cork cambium in blue. These are single layers of cells that form a cylinder around the length of the stem. The single cell layer of the vascular cambium is going to be specialized for cell division. So in some cases, the cell division is going to be along that single layer. So we're gonna get uh, an increase in the number of cells, and then cell growth is going to result in an increase in the diameter of that cylinder of vascular cambium. Let's take a look at why this is necessary. So the rest of the cell division that this cambium is gonna undergo is going to be producing xylem toward the center of the tree and phloem toward the outside of the tree. So here we have a cell division. We can think of the horizontal position of these boxes as being the horizontal position in space of these cells as this tree is increasing in diameter. So we've got first the vascular cambium cell in this position. It's gonna divide and one of the cells is gonna differentiate into xylem toward the interior of the tree. The other one is gonna stay as a meristem, this, these source cells. The next cell division is maybe going to contribute a cell of a secondary phloem to the external side of this vascular cambium. But as xylem is added toward the inside, this vascular cambium is gonna be moving out and out and out with each additional cell of xylem that it adds to the interior. So this is why we need to get an increase in the circumference or the diameter of this layer of vascular cambium itself to be able to accommodate this internal growth of xylem moving toward the center. Actually, the xylem doesn't move toward the center, the vascular cambium, by adding that material in that direction, actually moves itself outward toward the exterior of the tree. This other layer, cork cambium, only adds cells externally, these cork cells, and so they're just going to add more and more layers to the outside of the tree. And so this is showing, again, the position of that vascular cambium as more and more xylem cells differentiate. It's being pushed outward um, and increasing the diameter of that cylinder. And generally, it's going to produce more, more secondary xylem than secondary phloem. So we get the oldest cells furthest from the vascular cambium. So these are going to be the new cells that just divided right next to it, and they're gonna be progressively moving away so that the ones further away are the oldest uh, for both xylem and phloem. So the source is gonna be that vascular cambium. It's going to be dividing in both directions. The ones exterior to it are going to become phloem. The ones interior to it are going to become xylem. So let's take a closer look now at primary growth and how it works to lengthen roots and shoots. So primary growth arises from cells produced by apical meristems, as we've seen, and it's going to serve to elongate roots and shoots. In herbaceous plants, most of the plant consists of primary growth. In woody plants, only new non-woody parts represent primary growth. So addition of new branches, growth from the top of the tree, the elongation of the roots are going to be the primary growth that we see in woody plants such as trees. In woody plants, primary growth and secondary growth occur simultaneously, but in different locations. So you're gonna have thickening of the main stems, the branches that are um, finished with this elongation process, and then the new growth, the primary growth, is gonna happen just out at the tips. 
So first let's look at primary growth in the root system. So the root apical meristem is protected by a group of cells called the root cap. So the root cap is going to protect these actively dividing cells, which are very delicate. And they're going to be constantly replaced by cell division in the meristem as these root cap cells are abraded away due to moving through the soil. They're going to be replaced from the meristem. The root cap also is able to sense gravity to determine the direction of growth to make sure it's growing down into the soil. And it secretes a kind of a lubricant that's going to reduce the friction as that apical meristem is pushed through the soil to be able to help push it through. We find three distinct populations of cells behind the root cap. So here's the root cap, these kind of expendable cells that are gonna be sloughed off as this root moves through and replaced here from the meristem. First, there's the zone of cellular division. Then there's gonna be the zone of elongation. So this is where these newly divided cells, remember when a plant cell divides, it just lays down a new uh, cell wall in between the divided nuclei. And so these cells are gonna be half the size of the original cells to get to be normal cell size, they need to elongate. They primarily do that by expanding the central vacuole. Then finally, we have the zone of cellular maturation or differentiation. So at this point, the cells are going to differentiate into their particular cell types. So here we see epidermal cells that are differentiating to give rise to root hairs in the dermis. And then we also start to have the ground tissue cells differentiating into their particular functions and the differentiation of the vascular tissues. The primary growth of roots produces the epidermis, ground tissue, and vascular tissue, all the basic plant tissues that run throughout the entire body of the plant. The protoderm is the outermost primary meristem, so all through this area of uh, cellular division and cellular elongation before the cells become differentiated, this is the primary meristem, and so the outside cells in the primary meristem are going to be the protoderm. It's going to give rise to the epidermis. And so these root hairs are going to differentiate from, from this protoderm when it uh, matures. And these are epidermal cells that are modified for absorption. So these long extensions increase the surface area of these cells enormously to provide a good surface area for absorbing water and nutrients from the soil. And these root hairs make up around 70 to 90 percent of the total root surface area. So this is a huge elaboration of the surface to serve that function of absorption. The ground meristem is sandwiched between the protoderm and procambium. So this uh, color coded in white here, and it gives rise to the different kinds of ground tissue. The ground tissue in the roots is mostly going to become parenchyma cells, and they fill the cortex, which is the region between the vascular cylinder in the middle, in the case of roots, and the epidermis on the outside. So all of this stuff in between, so is cortex. So remember, the cortex is the word that we use to refer to ground tissue that is between the vascular tissue and the epidermis. Any ground tissue that is interior to the vascular bundles we call pith. So cortex, in the case of these roots, is all of this uh, ground tissue sandwiched uh, in the middle. The innermost layer of the cortex is called the endodermis. So just outside the vascular bundle, this is part of the cortex, so this is part of the ground tissue. It's going to form a little cylinder of cells around that vascular cylinder called the endodermis. The endodermis regulates passage of substances from the soil into the vascular cylinder. Now if we look at that innermost tissue in the growing root, this is going to be the procambium, and it gives rise to the central vascular cylinder of the root. The vascular cylinder has a solid core of xylem and phloem, and it's surrounded by a cell layer called the pericycle. So if we think of the very outermost layer of that inner core, that inner vascular cylinder, that's gonna be pericycle. So pericycle will be interior to that endodermis. Endodermis is gonna be part of the cortex, 
The pericycle is part of the vascular cylinder. So at this point we start to see some major differences between the two major groups of plants, the eudicots and the monocots. And one of these differences is in the arrangement of the vascular bundles in both the roots and the shoots. In most eudicots, the xylem forms the star-like shape in the center of the vascular cylinder, and the phloem is going to be found in between the arms of this star-like shape. So in this image that we're seeing, it's more um, like an X shape and then of xylem, and then the phloem is found in between the arms of the X. In monocots, seen over here to the right, there's a core of parenchyma cells that is surrounded by alternating rings of xylem and phloem. So we've got some ground tissue in here, and then the xylem is going to form a ring. These are, that's what these large circles are, a ring of xylem, and then phloem coming to the outside of that, some relatively smaller circles around the outside of that ring of xylem. Lateral roots develop from within the main root itself, and they arise from the pericycle, so this population of cells that surrounds the vascular cylinder. It's the first layer of the vascular cylinder. So the cells of the pericycle will begin to divide and form this lateral root structure that's just going to push through the rest of the tissue in that root uh, destructively, push its way out, destroy the cells around it. You can see it kind of bursting through the epidermis here. It's going to have its own layer of epidermis as it develops. So now let's take a look at the primary growth of shoots. A shoot apical meristem is a dome-shaped mass of dividing cells at the shoot tip. So here we have our little dome of rapidly dividing meristem cells. And the leaves of the apical bud protect the meristem. So these are newly developing leaves that are folded up and over to protect that delicate dividing tissue. Axillary buds develop from meristematic cells left at the bases of leaf primordia. So this is the last generation of leaves here to the side with axillary bud meristems that, if they're activated, will start to form a new branch um, and a new active meristem coming from that node. So axillary buds are kept dormant by chemical compounds that are released by the apical bud. So the apical bud is going to uh, send out this repressor signal that's going to keep the axillary meristem from dividing. So the closer an axillary bud is to the active apical bud, the more inhibited it is, the higher a dose it's going to get of this chemical signal telling it to not divide. Axillary buds are released from this apical dominance if the shoot tip is removed or shaded. So if for whatever reason we're not getting growth at the apical bud, the axillary buds will then start growing to maintain the growth of the plant. So lateral shoots are going to emerge from those axillary buds that have been released from dormancy. And they're going to do this non-destructively. They're going to come right from those uh, apical buds that are already present in the nodes uh, next to the, the leaves. And this is the basis of the practice that gardeners have of pruning or pinching off of these uh, apical buds to get a branchier, um, more full-looking plant. So after pruning, we call this apical bud decapitation, so removing the apical bud that's going to allow these lateral buds to grow, the lateral meristems, to start dividing and producing these lateral branches that look so nice. Here in the shoots, we see another major difference between the two major groups of land plants in eudicots, the vascular tissue consists of vascular bundles arranged in a ring. So this is different from what we saw in the roots. Make sure that you do kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the arrangement of these vascular tissues in eudicots compared to monocots and also in the shoots of eudicots as compared to the sh roots of eudicots the shoots of monocots as compared to the roots of monocots. So in the shoots of eudicots, we've got this ring of vascular tissue. Here we have the xylem to the interior, the phloem just outside it. 
We've got sclerenchyma fiber cells that are that help support the stem, and the xylem and phloem together are called the vascular bundle. In most monocot stems, the vascular bundles are scattered throughout the ground, ground tissue rather than forming an organized ring structure. They're found mostly toward the outside, but you'll see vascular bundles scattered throughout that ground tissue. So now let's think about the organization of leaves and the development of leaves. So the ground tissue in a leaf is called mesophyll. We saw this before when we were thinking about, in particular, uh, C4 plants. This mesophyll is the ground tissue and it's sandwiched between the upper and lower epidermis of a leaf. So here we have an upper epi epidermis, a lower epidermis, and we've got this mesophyll in between. To help you remember this word, meso means middle, phyll refers to leaf, so this is basically the middle of the leaf. And the mesophyll of eudicots has two layers. So there are these elongated cells on the upper surface called palisade mesophyll. So here, it's elongated cells. And in the lower part of the leaf, we have what we call spongy mesophyll. These are sort of loosely spaced parenchyma cells that allows easy gas exchange within the leaf. So most of these stomata are found on this lower surface next to the spongy mesophyll, fill, and that allows the gas to kind of circulate around these loosely spaced cells. The vascular tissue of each leaf is continuous with the vascular tissue of the stem. In fact, the whole vascular system of the entire plant is a continuous network of joined vessels. So here in this leaf we can see this network of vessels that's going to spread out into the whole leaf and come into contact closely with each and every cell of the leaf. Veins are the leaf's vascular bundles and function also as the leaf's skeleton to give it some structural stiffness and maintain its shape. Each vein in a leaf is enclosed by a protective bundle sheath. So we saw these bundle sheath cells again when we were thinking about C4 plants. In C4 plants, remember that they play a role in photosynthesis. That's where the Calvin cycle is going to occur. So these are very specialized bundle sheath cells. But other plants, C3 plants, CAM plants, also have um, bundle sheaths that are surrounding and protecting the, the vascular tissue. So now let's change gears a bit and think about secondary growth. So remember, secondary growth is increasing the thickness of plants, and we see this primarily in woody plants. So many land plants display secondary growth, the growth in thickness produced by these lateral meristems, these cylindrical structures. Secondary growth occurs in gymnosperms, which are conifer trees, cone-producing cone trees, usually with needle-like leaves, and then also many eudicots, the angiosperms, the flowering plants, but it's very rare in monocots, which consist of grasses and other herbaceous plants. Secondary growth increases the width of roots and shoots, increasing the amount of conducting tissue available and providing increased structural support. So the evolution of secondary growth is hugely important to the ability of plants to reach very large body sizes, both giving the structural support that's needed in a terrestrial environment to uh, resist the forces of gravity, but also providing that bulk transport system that's going to allow materials to be moved effectively through even a very large body. Secondary growth produces wood and occurs in species that have a cambium in addition to apical meristems. So remember cambium is that secondary meristem tissue that's going to be actively undergoing mitosis. Secondary growth occurs in stems and roots of woody plants, but very rarely in leaves. Leaves are generally produced by primary growth. And keep in mind, primary growth and secondary growth occur simultaneously in different parts of these woody plants. New branches are added, branches are lengthened, roots are lengthened by primary growth at the same time that their diameter is being thickened by secondary growth. So what is a cambium? A cambium differs from an apical meristem. First of all, it forms a cylinder that runs the length of the root, trunk, or branch, and its cells divide to increase the width of the plant rather than the length. There are two types of cambia in plants. There's a vascular cambium that's located between the secondary xylem and the secondary phloem. And then there's cork cambium that's located near the outer perimeter of the root trunk or branch. 
So the vascular cambium is wholly responsible for the production of secondary vascular tissue. The primary vascular tissue is going to be generated during primary growth from that inner section of the primary meristem called the procambium. The secondary vascular tissue is going to be generated by the vascular cambium. In a typical woody stem, the vascular cambium is located outside the pith and primary xylem and to the inside of the primary phloem. So here we have a section through the growing part of a plant uh, that's undergoing or nearly completing primary growth. So section here through someplace near the tip. And here we see the pith. Remember pith is the ground tissue that's interior um, to the vascular tissue. Here's the primary xylem that was laid down during primary growth. Here's the primary phloem and the vascular cambium is going to develop right in between them as a single cell layer cylindrical sheath between the two. In a typical woody root, the vascular cambium forms exterior to the primary xylem and interior to the primary phloem and pericycle. So remember, there's no pith in, in eudicot roots. The vascular tissue is found right at the very center, but you're still gonna find the vascular cambium sandwiched between the primary xylem and the primary phloem. In cross-section, the vascular cambium appears as a ring of meristematic cells one cell layer thick. So remember, it's actually a cylinder, but if you're looking at it in a cross-section, it's going to look like just a line of a single cell layer. Division of these cells increases the vascular cambium's circumference and adds secondary xylem to the inside and secondary phloem to the outside. So we saw this in the diagram when we went over secondary growth in general terms, but here we can see here is the vascular cambium. It's laying down secondary xylem to the interior. Here's the primary xylem still um, to the inside of the vascular cambium. Here is the primary phloem, and then the secondary phloem is being deposited by the vascular cambium in between the vascular cambium and the primary phloem. So the cells in plants that would be sort of analogous to uh, adult stem cells are known as initials, sometimes just called stem cells. And so there are elongated, undifferentiated stem cell-like cells in the vascular cambium that are oriented parallel to the axis. So they would be going up and down through this section. So parallel to the axis of the stem or root. And these are the cells that when they divide are going to give rise to all of these vessels of the vascular system. They're gonna give rise to tracheids, vessel elements. Also, um, fibers of the xylem. So remember, there's some sclerenchyma within the phloem that's going to uh, make it very rigid and woody. So these are the fibers. Remember, fibers are a cell type of sclerenchyma. So sclerenchyma is the tissue type, fibers are the cell type, and also the sieve tube elements and companion cells of the phloem. So these are going to be oriented up and down along the axis of the growing trunk, branch, or root. There are also going to be shorter initials, these stem cells, that are going to be perpendicular to the root. And these are going to produce structures called vascular rays. So these are going to connect the secondary xylem and phloem. They're gonna facilitate transport of materials and also cellular signals between the, between the two sections on either side of the vascular cambium. And these vascular rays are also going to contribute to uh, wound repair. So these are parenchyma cells that are going to maintain some totipotency, some ability to differentiate into different cell types to facilitate the repair of wounds. Secondary xylem is going to accumulate. It's going to be added um, interiorly as the vascular cambium moves outward. And so this is going to accumulate, and this is the material that we think of as wood. It consists of tracheids and vessel elements in angiosperms, and also these fibers, the sclerenchyma cells. Early wood is formed in the spring in temperate regions it has thin cell walls to maximize water deliveries. These cells are going to be most active in the transport of water early in the spring to make sure there's plenty of water getting to those leaves, those new leaves for photosynthesis. Here we have the early wood with these very large open xylem vessels. 
the late wood that is formed in the summer is going to function more in structural support. So you can see that the, the vessels are not nearly as large. They're not going to play as much of a role in water transport, and they're going to contribute more to structural support. So this is where we get these tree rings from. So tree rings are visible where the late and early wood meet. So here we have a ring made up of early wood and late wood. And these rings can be used to estimate a tree's age. This is one year's worth of growth between rings. So the field of dendrochronology, so dendro literally refers to branches. Chronology is a study of a sequence of events in time. So dendrochronology is used to analyze tree ring growth patterns, and it can tell us something about the climate in the past to give us information about climate change. So thick rings indicate a year with warm or wet growing conditions, so that indicates a lot of growth. So if there's a large distance uh, between the two barriers that indicate the start of growth, we know that we had a lot of growth in that year. It was probably a warm and or wet year. So thinner rings, a smaller distance between those two barriers indicates very little growth in that year, so probably a cold or dry year. As a tree or woody shrub ages, the older layers of secondary xylem, known as the heartwood, here in the very middle of the, the tree trunk, no longer transport water and minerals. They're now used just for structural support, and the outer layers, these are known as sapwood, still transport materials through the xylem. So this is water with dissolved minerals, remember this is xylem, that is still going to be used toward the outside of the tree. We have a layer of active phloem uh, around the outside, of course. We still need to transport those sugars throughout the plant, but the older ones that you would expect to find sort of to the outside, those are generally sloughed off as they're no longer being used to tr transport sugars and this is that kind of flaky look that you see to the outside of the bark is those outer materials being sloughed off and discarded, and the act of sugar transport is happening just to the outside of the vascular cambium. So now let's take a look at the cork cambium. So cork cambium gives rise to cork cells that accumulate to the exterior of the cork cambium. So here we see the cork cambium and the cork cells growing outward from there. So the cork cells deposit a substance called suberum. It's a waxy substance, water resistant, uh, and then they die. So they form a structure of dead rigid cells to the outside of the tree. The cork cambium and the tissues it produces compose a layer of what we call periderm. This is the outer layer of the tree that's going to replace the epidermis. So here we see the epidermis on the outside, the cortex underneath it, we get the development of the cork cambium that's going to lay down the cork and the epidermis is now gone. This periderm has completely replaced it. So we usually think of bark as just being that outer layer of material that's being sloughed off the tree. Usually it looks kind of scaly, but actually bark goes a lot deeper than, than we usually consider. So bark consists of all of the tissues external to the vascular cambium, including the secondary phloem. So this part of the bark, at least, is living active tissue that is doing the job of distributing sugars from the, from the leaves. So secondary phloem and periderm both contribute to the substance that botanists call bark. So thinking about this outer layer, the periderm, remember it's full of this waxy material called suberin, so it's going to be fairly impermeable to water and gases. So that's good for regulating water loss to making sure that water is not just evaporating out from the cells, but there are still active living cells within that need to be provided with oxygen for the metabolic processes. So these openings called lenticels in the periderm allow a certain amount of gas exchange to these cells just interior to the dead cork cells. So here we see 
an image of the interior of one of these lenticels. It's a little opening that allows gas. So here we have the living parenchyma cells continuous with the living parenchyma cells in the interior of the trunk. And this is going to allow air to kind of circulate between these loosely spaced cells and allow it to percolate through to all of the cells that need oxygen for survival. So now we've seen all of these different primary tissues, these meristematic tissues, and what they give rise to. Let's just do a quick review using this concept map as a guide. So we start with an apical meristem, and that apical meristem is going to give rise to three primary meristem tissues. The protoderm, which will give rise to the epidermis. The procambium, which is going to give rise to the primary phloem and primary xylem, so the vascular tissues, and then ground meristem, which is going to give rise to all of the ground tissue, and that will include pith, interior to the vascular tissue, and cortex, exterior to the vascular tissue. The cortex gives rise to the cortcambium. The procambium ultimately gives rise to the vascular cambium. Remember, this is going to develop in between the primary phloem and the primary xylem, and it's going to develop from procambium cells. The vascular cambium is then in turn going to give rise to secondary phloem to the exterior of it, and secondary xylem to the interior of it, also contributing cells to itself to increase in diameter as that secondary xylem is deposited inside and the diameter of the whole structure increases. The cork cambium is going to give rise to cork cells, which are going to form along with the cambium, the periderm. So now that we have a good understanding of these structures and their development, in the next couple of web lectures, we're going to be taking a closer look at these xylem and phloem structures and how they're used in the absence of a muscular system, in the absence of any kind of movement, how they result in the movement of fluids through the system. So we'll be looking at xylem in the next web lecture and then phloem in the following one.